Talleyrand by Robin Harris, book review. So I actually bought this book when I was still living in Japan. I was in Fukuoka City and I was in one of the bigger bookstores that had a bit of an English section. It's always difficult to find English books in Japan. But the biggest, bigger bookstores do have a small English section. And I was browsing through it and I saw this history uh, and I saw the name Talleyrand. And I actually, I didn't know who Talleyrand was before I picked up this biography. But I knew the name definitely sounded familiar. Like I, I knew this was sounded like the name of somebody that I should know about. He, some somebody that had come up before, and maybe other books I had read somewhere that it couldn't quite place. Uh, and I looked at the book, and it looked like Talleyrand had had a very interesting life, and he had been involved in the French Revolution uh, and the Napoleonic Wars, and both of these are areas of history that I was quite interested in. So I decided to buy the book and check it out. Now, on the off chance that you don't know anything about the life of Talleyrand either, it turns out he had a very varied and interesting life. Let, let me try and sum this up. So he started out as a clergyman. Then he worked his way up the ranks to become the Archbishop of Autun. Uh, and then 1789 happened and the Estates General was opened and Talleyrand became very active in the French Revolution. He was, uh, he was part of the church at the time, but he was uh, working to reform the clergy. He, he came up with the civil constitution of the clergy. Eventually he left the church altogether for his greater political ambitions uh, in the French Revolution. But then when the French Revolution got too hot for him, uh, you know, that period where everyone's getting guillotined. Uh, then he fled to England. He was declared an undesirable alien in England. Uh, so then he went to America. And then once things calmed down in France, Talleyrand returned to France and became involved with the Directory. So this was the, the stage of the French Revolution that was under the Directory. Uh, as such, he became the foreign minister under the Directory. He organized Napoleon's disastrous expedition into Egypt. Uh, later, Talleyrand then helped organize Napoleon's coup in 1799. And then he served as Napoleon's foreign minister, uh, reshaping together with Napoleon all of the maps of Europe. Then, once Talleyrand became disillusioned with Napoleon, he helped to organize Napoleon's downfall behind his back uh, and arranged for the restoration of Louis XVIII. Then, after the Bourbon kings were thrown out in the July Revolution in 1830, uh, Talleyrand served as the French ambassador to London under the new king, Louis Philippe, uh, before finally dying in 1838. So, that's obviously a lot of ground to cover in one biography. And in fact, the author opens with a quote from Talleyrand's secretary that says, I have often myself seen Talleyrand smile at the idea of anyone attempting his biography. Excuse me. So, perhaps because of the vast amount of material that needs to be covered in this biography, the author Robin Harris gives virtually no background information about any of the events he's talking about. So, for example, when he's talking about the French directory or uh, what, what's going on there, he doesn't really give any of the background information. He just focuses on what Talleyrand is doing. The assumption throughout seems to be that the reader is already well-versed uh, in 19th century and 18th century European history, and you're just seeking a better analysis of what you already know. This may be partly because this book was originally published in England. So I, I bought it in Japan at the expatriate uh, section of the bookstore. Uh, but this maybe this book wasn't designed for Americans. Maybe this was designed for English people who already maybe had a firmer grasp on European history. I don't know. Uh, I found it a lot to absorb at once though, and I, I found I struggled with the background information. I had 
in my apartment at the time a biography of Napoleon, the, the one from the World Leaders Past and Present series that I had just finished. So I was constantly referring back to that to get more of the background information uh, as I read. Um, if I had the, to choose the best biography of Talleyrand, uh, I think I would have gone instead with a biography that gave more background information to the reader. Um, but this is the one I had. Uh, so this is the one I struggled through, and I, I still enjoyed it mostly. Uh, Talleyrand had a fascinating life. There's a lot in here, but just to pick out a couple things, it was really interesting for me to read about his life as a clergyman and a bishop uh, before the French Revolution. Uh, he was very sexually promiscuous, um, which surprised me because, like, he's a bishop, right? But the uh, impression you get from this book is that this was not at all unusual at the time. The, the impression I got is kind of all the clergy were sexually active at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, that surprised me initially, but I guess maybe that this has been true for large parts of history. Uh, you, you know, we talk about, you know, 2,000 years of Christian Europe, uh, but during... I mean, I, I grew up in a Protestant community. I think maybe Protestants, arguably, uh, are, are a bit more serious than some of the, the Catholics, especially Catholics in countries where Catholicism is, is the state religion. Um, but yeah, it, it is a reminder, I guess, t to me that uh, through a large parts of Christian history, people didn't really take the doctrine all that seriously. Uh, it, it, it seemed that the impression I got from reading this biography is that the title of bishop was very coveted because it had some political power to it and had prestige, but people didn't seriously think that you needed to have like a holy life to leave that, to, to, to be a bishop, is the impression I got from this book at least. Uh, there were a lot of scandals throughout the life of Talleyrand. Uh, he comes, he comes, the impression you get of him from this book is he was just really cocky. Yeah, yeah, you know, like when you were in school, the smartest kid in the room who knew he was the smartest kid in the room and was just really cocky about it. You get the impression that Talleyrand is like that. And another thing of interest, uh, I, something that actually ties in with my knowledge of American history. Something I remember vaguely from my American history classes is the XYZ affair. Does anyone else remember this vaguely from their American history classes? Uh, hear about X, Y, and Z when, when studying American history? So I had heard about it. I had, I, maybe I knew what it was at one time, but I had forgotten it. Uh, it turns out that Talleyrand, Talleyrand was directly connected to that. Uh, and I'm going to quote from the book at length because I, I think this is interesting. This is the section of the book describing the X, Y, and Z affair. Since 1796, French corsairs had been attacking American shipping in retaliation against the Jay Treaty between the U.S. and Britain which was deemed by Paris to have breached the terms of American neutrality. A delegation was sent to Paris in the autumn of 1797 to recover damages for U.S. losses and to bring an end to the dispute. But the three American ne negotiators, John Marshall, Charles Pickney, and Elbridge Gerry, were shocked by the treatment they received. They were, they were approached by a series of agents whose precise status was obscure, but who were clearly working for Talleyrand and who figured in President Adams' later report to Congress on the matter as X, Y, and Z. The American envoys were told that the precondition for success was the payment of what amounted to substantial bribes. Specifically, they were asked to underwrite a loan of 32 million Dutch florins, to make a gift of 50,000 gold louis to the directory, and to provide sweeteners for the foreign minister and his inter intermediaries. 
The Americans sent back a long, indignant report about these outrageous proceedings, which President Adams duly conveyed to Congress. The scandal in the United States was immense. It reached the French public through British press, sorry, through British press reports. Talleyrand indignant, indignantly defended his reputation. He even managed to persuade Gary, the most francophile of the U.S. negotiators, to lend some support to his protestations of innocence. To the Directory, he simply denied any knowledge. His protestations can hardly have been credible, but for a time he survived in office. This was partly because Barras, his protector, was involved as well. But it was also because, despite the scandal, both the French and the American governments knew that no one was better equipped to negotiate the peace between them than Talleyrand. It was in order to press these complicated negotiations forward that the Directory wanted Talleyrand to stay in Paris rather than go to Constantinople. In quote. Uh, so I thought that was all very interesting and an interesting little connection to American history. By the way, throughout the book, Talleyrand's corruption and his willingness to take bribes is an ongoing theme. Uh, although, as the author points out, quote, far from alienating foreign powers, Talleyrand's venality pleased them. It seemed to guarantee his flexibility. In short, uh, in quote, sorry, uh, and then to sum up my review, in short, although sections of this book were a struggle for me, I enjoyed it on the whole, and I think it helped a lot to broaden my understanding of this time period in history. I'd recommend it.